Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. We want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day today, and uh, also let you guys know about a few upcoming things. I haven't checked the weather yet for Tuesday night, but we do, okay, I just got a thumbs up. We do an annual party in the park at the end of our community group, small group ministry that is everybody in our church family is invited and everybody in the community. And that is this coming Tuesday night at Glazebrook Park. There's a combination of soccer and Frisbee and pizza and chips and cookies and fruit and veggies if you prefer a little bit of a healthier option. And uh, it's a great time where we come and we gather together um, and then there's a few other events that are up and coming next month on June 9th. We have our Haskell Park kickoff, which does the Sunday evening music thing. And the cool thing is, you don't have to remember all of this, we printed a front and back copy of Stay Current. So at the end of the service, uh, as you're headed out, uh, probably someone from the welcoming team may have one of these in your hand, or to hand you, and you can take it back for reference. The other thing is, between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we partner with Thrive, which is a pregnancy resource center, and a lot of you guys in previous years will know these. This is a bottle that you're supposed to fill up with change or dollars or checks, and uh, there's a cool rhythm. You pick it up on Mother's Day, and you seek to turn it back into us on Father's Day, and then Thrive Ministry comes and collects those bottles um, as well at the end of that. So this coming Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, Glazebrook Park, and then next next month, Haskell Park uh, kickoff will be two things. And on Haskell kickoff, we get to play a part in that by giving the community donut, not donuts, we get donuts on Sunday morning, hot dogs and chips, and then we do a lot of carnival games as well. So if you're like, hey, I'd like to help and serve, that would be awesome because we are looking for volunteers with all of that as well. Cool, there's a slide there too. Awesome. All right. Uh, Well, let's go ahead and jump in here to the call to worship. It's from Psalm 139, and this is what it says. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. God is with us. He knows everything about us. He's for us, and he's invited us to worship him in spirit and in truth today. So I invite you to stand, greet someone that you know or maybe don't know, and then uh, we'll begin singing together.
2 Corinthians 1, uh, 18 through 22 says this, As surely God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come.
Father, thank you for being a God who is faithful even when we are not. Lord, thank you for your grace and your patience with us, for your severe mercies, which are new every morning. God, thank you for being a God who is a God of yes and amens, and your no's are not yet. Lord, we love you, and it is our honor and our privilege to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite all of you to be seated for a little bit. One really cool thing that we get to participate in and play a part in is baby dedications. And it's appropriate that on Mother's Day we have one of those. So at this time, I'd like Clyde and Whitney Phelps and their little boy Pete to come forward. And uh, I think, yes, we have some information up here about baby Pete. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and give uh, Clyde and Whitney just an opportunity uh, to say hi and share a little bit with us, and then we're going to have a prayer uh, for baby Pete, dedicating him to the Lord. So, cool. All right. Hello. Oh. We just have a simple prayer and wish for our baby that he may know the Lord in all of his love. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Amen. That you may know the Lord in all of his love for you, and we pray. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> we pray that as you grow, so will your relationship with him. And we just want to thank God for the precious gift of life and, and parenthood. And we want to thank our family and friends for the continuous love and support. And thank you to our church family for all the prayers for our new family. <laughs> Making this difficult for <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And uh, the other awesome thing is just as, as they prayed um, that, they may, that Pete may know the Lord, uh, we play a part in that. We get invited into that story. And just as you've prayed for Clyde and Whitney and Pete, uh, we have an opportunity to do that very formally now. And if you are willing to make a commitment to the Lord and to Clyde and to Whitney to come alongside of them as they raise their son in a way that points them to the deep, deep love of God found in Jesus, I want to encourage you at this time to raise your hand as high as you can. All these people are with you, for you, love you. And uh, we'll go ahead and have you guys extend your hands toward uh, Pete and Clyde and Whitney, and we'll go ahead and do a prayer dedication for Pete. Father, thank you so much for the deep, deep love that you have for Clyde and Whitney through your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would fill them with your love and that that love would overflow out of them to touch their son, Pete. And just as Whitney and Clyde have recognized that Pete is a gift from you, Lord, that you would speak even now to Pete and let him continually know of the deep, deep love. They are seeking to give him back to you, knowing that he is a great gift from you, and you'll guide and direct them each step of the way, and we dedicate him to you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. On behalf of the church, see you guys there. All right, thanks. That is, uh, you know, there's a lot of favorite parts to being part of a church family, but man, that ranks right up at the top. Um, We, as a church family, have been blessed with a number of kids birth through fifth grade, and uh, we have an opportunity, we pray for them every single week uh, around this time as we kind of dismiss them and commission them off to children's church classrooms 
where they learn continually about the deep, deep love of Jesus as well. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that at that time. If you're a child, birth through fifth grade, you've got some children's church teachers waiting for you. And as the kids make their way to their classes, uh, please join me in praying for them as well. Father, thank you for the gift of children, the gift of being parents. Lord, and just as we were blessed to witness another child dedicated to you today, Lord, we dedicate those in our church family to you from birth to uh, even the oldest child of God here. Lord, that you would grip us and that you would speak powerfully today to each one of us and remind us all that all your promises are yes and amen in your son Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today is Mother's Day, as we've mentioned, and just happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers, who have mothers. Um, and I know that this day can be a really sweet and beautiful day, um, just in the celebration that we just saw. It can also be a really hard day. It can be a day that uh, if you recently lost a mother or if there are things going on as a parent and child, that can be really hard. Um, and the next song that we're going to sing is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, we can sing this today, whether we're celebrating full of joy or whether there's a bit of grief or a lot of grief. And in the midst of lamentations, and this is a verse that's read so often that sometimes I think we tune it out, but this is such at the core of what it is to believe in Christ and to believe the gospel. And so my prayer this morning is that this just soothes your soul and lifts your spirit because I believe that's God's intention today for us. Lamentations 3, 22 to 25. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. So with that in mind, if you'll just stand and sing with us this morning. Join us as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever will be. Thy faithfulness, great. Oh. 
presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine with ten thousand besides. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Father, we are just so thankful for your faithfulness. We're thankful for your mercy, your grace, and your steadfast love that never ends. But we're thankful today for the women you put in our life that are mothers. What a blessing. Lord, we, uh, we just sit with you today. We ask by your spirit to still our hearts, our souls. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Just your greatness, your faithfulness, and your love, and your word that is so true and perfect. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible with you today, or it'll also be on the screen, Uh, we are in the book of Ruth, and uh, we're in Ruth chapter 3 today, and just a little bit of quick review. At the beginning of the book of Ruth, we meet a woman named Naomi, and there's famine in Israel, and she goes to a place where there's food. And while she's there, Naomi's husband dies, and then Naomi's two sons die. And Naomi is left with two daughters-in-law, and Naomi tells the daughters-in-law, you go back to Moab, which is where they are, a foreign land. I am going to go back to Israel, and I can't do anything else for you. And Orpah departs, and Ruth cleans to Naomi and says, I will not let you go until you promise that I can come with you. And some of you are facing uh, aspects of tragedy and disappointment and pain and loss. Uh, I've, I've counted there at least three of you out here today in our church family where this is the first Mother's Day without your mom. Your mom is, has gone home and the eternal home. And God wants you to know and to hear today, I am clinging to you, and I will not let you go. I am promising that wherever you go, I'll go with you. That Ruth makes this promise to Naomi, and Ruth has no idea what she's getting herself into. And it's kind of like how promises go, right? This is a kind of a season. It seems like there's a spring season and summer season and fall season and sometimes even winter where people get married. Actually, people get married all year round, right? But when we make 
promises on our wedding day. We are making promises, but we don't completely and totally know all of what we're getting ourselves into. When you make a promise to a community of faith, you're making a promise, but you don't always know exactly all of what you're getting yourself into. But you make a promise. And when Ruth and Naomi go back, people are happy to see Naomi, and Naomi very quickly corrects them and says, don't, don't be happy to see me. You don't know what happened to me. Lots of bad stuff happened to me. But then Ruth goes out into this field. Ruth chapter 2 tells us that she happened upon a field. It was coincidence. It was luck that she happened to go to a certain field owned by a man named Boaz. And when Naomi finds out after a large number of food, after interaction between Ruth and Boaz, Naomi gets excited. And Naomi comes up with a plan. And we plan today, right? Most of us. You know what? Interestingly enough, even if you don't plan, you plan not to plan. So every single thing that we do in all of life is a plan. And Naomi has recognized that God and his sovereignty and providence has steered and led Ruth to a very specific field for a very specific time such as this. And Naomi comes up with a plan. And sometimes our plans go well. And other times, our plans don't go very well. And this is a good idea for us now to say moms and women in general, and guys, there's a few of us out there that may be good planners, okay? But for the most part, the heavy lifting in most homes is done by women, all right? That there is a certain level of responsibility and planning to make sure everything functions, and we just want to, well, I as one man anyway, want to say thank you. Uh, for all that you do in that. Around Christmas time, there's a little picture that floats around on social media that has this. And uh, wife's list for Christmas shopping. And it's like never ending. Husband's list for Christmas shopping, buy wife a gift. <laughs> okay? <laughs> there is now. And I understand that's not the way it works all the time, okay? But there is a lot of planning that takes place. And Naomi is planning something. A lot of times we can look at things in regards to our walk with the Lord and go, two extremes, okay? One extreme is, well, if I don't plan absolutely everything, God is not going to move. Well, that's not true because it says that Ruth happened upon a certain field that was Boaz's field, that the hidden hand and direction of God is behind everything we do that nothing is by accident, and that God is always at work for his people, whether you work or not. But there's another extreme that is, oh, well, if God's working, then I don't have to do anything, and I can just sit on my behind and just enjoy the ride. And that's an extreme that's equally wrong, because every single time that God is working in every single thing, he's inviting you and I into it. He's saying, look at how I set this table. Now I want you to eat, or I want you to help serve. I don't just want to set the table and then just have you sit. I want you to get into the game. And, and, and kids get this. I mean, baby Pete understood this, at the baby dedication. He saw the microphone and went, oh, Mom's talking, dad's talking, I want to get into the game. Now, he may also just like the color blue, and it was a blue microphone. I don't know, but he wanted to get into the game. God is inviting you and I in, and it is important, and we're going to find out from Naomi that Naomi is not just operating only by her feelings. Yes, her feelings are heavily involved in it, but she's thinking. And she is calculating and going, okay, God, this is what I see that you put before me. Now, I want to make the best possible use of this. And I'm going to plan out what might happen next. And why is she wanting to do this? It says in verse 
1 of chapter 3, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? What is motivating Naomi's plan? Deep, deep love for her daughter-in-law that will bring her daughter-in-law rest and security. This word rest in Hebrew can sometimes be translated also as home. Let's think about that for a little bit. Ideally, in most situations, our homes ought to be places of refuge and rest. That it's a time where, and, it's, it's, you know, it's, and, and oftentimes this is the gift of a woman in a home too, that a woman is able to turn a house into a home. That, that Naomi is looking and she's recognized that she's completely bankrupt of her resources. She doesn't have what it takes. This is why she pushed her daughters-in-law away in chapter one. I don't have what I most want to give you. I want to be able to give you rest and a home and security so that it would go well with you. That word well, that, that, that there's a shalom peace in that, that everything in Naomi's plan is, I want the absolute best for you. And I will plan and take action to do everything I can in my power for the absolute best for you. We do that for the people we love, don't we? That we'll look and we'll think and we'll go, how might this be best for the ones that I love? So she plans. Naomi is not alone in planning. The Bible is very clear in Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a very popular verse. But God also has a plan for us. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. God knows the plans plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan, and it's not to harm you. So uh, earlier this week, I was talking with someone, and, and uh, unfortunately, people can get caricatures of who God is and what his posture is toward us. And this person had been given the posture or the caricature, the picture of a God who basically is the angry dictator in the sky that's ready to strike us down with lightning bolts anytime we do anything wrong at all. And she said, I, I don't know that I want that God. That God is mean. I don't want to follow that God. To which we had to ask some questions. Well, yeah, that God is mean. Is that God this God? Is that God the God that is described in this book that tells us this is who God is? Because this book says that God, in creating us, created us out of love, and though we wandered and sinned and became enemies of God, God did not strike you and I down with lightning bolts, but God sent his one and only perfect son to take the lightning bolt in our place to make us right with God. Because God has a plan, and he knows his plan for us, and it's not to harm us, but to give us a hope and a future. Naomi has a plan. And as we read this chapter, the plan is going to sound a little bit weird, a little bit scandalous, and we're going to talk a little bit about the culture and why she's recommending, a little bit of why she's recommending. But this is matchmaker via Naomi, okay? She knows that Boaz is interested in Ruth. She believes Ruth is interested in Boaz. And she is going to say, and now I am going to make it work to where this is how, Ruth, you best communicate to Boaz. I like you. Here we go. Ruth chapter 3. I already read verse 1, so we'll pick up with verse 2. Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? Sorry. Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go 
and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. And we'll stop here for a second. What does Naomi tell Ruth to do? Get on your best dress, spray or pour on your best perfume, and sneak in to the place where Boaz, the man you're interested in, is working, and kind of spy and make sure that he has satisfied himself with food and drink and is in a happy and merry mood. Okay, She does not want him to be hangry at this point. And then once he goes to sleep, I want you to lay down by his feet, and I want you actually to uncover his feet. This is in the middle of the night. That everything in chapter 3 happens from sunset to sunrise. This is in the middle of the night. Now, dads out there that have daughters, especially, how many of you, or even moms for that matter, would go and say, okay, you want someone, a man, to express interest in you. This is what you do. You sneak into his house at night after he's eaten and go to sleep, and then you just lay down in the bed at his feet and uncover his feet, and then when he wakes up, he will tell you what to do. Whoa. What does Boaz know that maybe we don't know? Sorry, not Boaz. Uh, Well, Boaz knows some stuff too. But what does Naomi know that maybe we don't know that we don't understand? Naomi knows, number one, the culture, and number two, the character. And that makes a huge difference. Culture, and, 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 and sometimes the church is a little bit behind the culture, Okay, that, that uh, a lot of churches really boomed in the 50s and 60s. And instead of understanding that we have a call to exegete Scripture, understand Scripture well, we also have a call to understand the culture well. And sometimes uh, things that worked in the 50s and 60s in the church world don't actually work very well in 2019. And that we need to be aware of the ways to make sure this is a message that will never lose its relevance. But the means by which we communicate this message matters. It is important. And we need to continually be thinking about, because the human heart has never changed, how and by what mediums do we most effectively communicate this good news of great joy? And Naomi knew that Ruth, as a Moabitess, might not have known all of these things. So she coaches her daughter-in-law. I've been blessed. I've been a baseball coach, a soccer coach, and a swim team coach. And you know what happens when you're a coach? There are athletes that you have that are very coachable and athletes that you have that are very uncoachable, (laughs) okay? And the coachable ones, man, they're a joy to work with. And the uncoachable ones are like, oh, all right, they're going to do their thing. And if it works, great, but if it doesn't work, they're not going to listen to any kind of advice or instruction that I give. Ruth says, all that you say I will do. That Naomi as mother-in-law and Ruth as daughter-in-law are in a mutual relationship of trust and respect. Ruth does not push back. Ruth does not say, well, I think I have a better idea. This says, all that you say, I will do. Let's look at this book again. That this book, more than just God's word, is also God's words of love and direction to you and I. And in this book, there are some specific commands and directives that God gives to us And that we need to figure out, am I going to put myself under his word? And am I going to be coachable by the creator and savior of my soul? And as I hear things in his word, am I going to respond by saying, all that you say I will do, no matter how little sense it may make, or, and this is more popular to the rebellious, sinful heart, 
that every single one of us have. From time to time, I can look at a verse there. Had one growing up. I was in these Bible drills. You're supposed to memorize scripture. And one of the shortest verses was, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And I, my mom and dad gave me an opportunity to choose in what order I wanted to memorize the verses. And love your enemies and do good to those who hate you was one of the easiest, shortest verses to memorize. But I memorized the last. And finally, one day, my mom said, well, Stephen, this one's really easy. Why don't you memorize this one? I don't like what it says. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. So I'm thinking I'm going to keep my distance from that directive and from that verse because I don't like what it says. And maybe if I don't have to memorize it, I can just kind of ignore it. That there is an attitude out there when it comes to Scripture that we use pick and choose. And boy, there are popular things that we grab onto. Like, therefore... There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 1, okay? But we can grab on to that one. But sometimes we may not want to grab on to, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. That we may struggle to grab on to a verse that says, if anyone wants to save his life, he must lose it for my sake. But if anyone loses his life for my sake, then he will truly find it. You might not want to hold on to a verse that says, it is more blessed to give than to receive, because by golly, we just can't afford to give of our time and our talents and our money. You see, it's it's not one of these things of, well, I just, uh, I, I don't really have the same understanding of Scripture that what that means exactly. I, God, God's pretty clear about a lot of things. Okay, it's like one of these things where somebody once had this idea of, well, you know what? I need to pray about whether it's right to pay taxes or not. Actually, You don't need to pray about that one. The Bible says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And it's very clear. That one, you don't need to pray about. He tells you, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus when it comes to this situation. All right, taxes. What is the wrong with the pastor today? Here's another one. Tithes. The Malachi 3.10 says that God is inviting us to bring our tithes and offerings into the house of God. And he says that when this happens, that God says, test me in this. And I will open up for you a blessing so large that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3.10. Here's an interesting thing, because it may be one of those things where you go, um, all, all these things that you say, God, I will do, okay? But then God also gives incentives and promises and connections. Last time I checked, us giving something to someone, and then that person saying, guess what? You give me this, I'll give you a blessing so large there will not be room enough to receive it. It's not actually bad stewardship. It's the best kind of stewardship. It's called investment and things of eternity. But why are we struggling with this? Uh, Because we maybe aren't that coachable or aren't that surrendered to really trust in God knows better than I do. God knows better how to manage my life than I do. God knows better how to manage my stuff than I do. So I am going to seek to be coachable in these areas of my life. Naomi has surrendered to her mother-in-law. God tells us, surrender yourself to me and trust me. And then the other thing Naomi does, 
and I, and I think maybe I have this as a point just because I really like this expression. She carpe diems the situation. This is a seize the night moment for Naomi. And I almost get this idea of this woman who in her grief was very idle and just lay down on the bed. And now when she finds out that God happened, the hidden hand of God to direct Ruth to Boaz's field and Naomi hears this, she's not idle anymore. She's jumped up in this little room where Ruth and Naomi are living and Naomi's walking and going, and then oh, oh, this dress and, and this perfume. And guess what? It's gonna be so amazing. This is gonna be so awesome. And don't worry, Boaz is gonna tell you what to do. But she uncovers, she's told to uncover Boaz's feet in the middle of the night. A woman, a younger woman, going to the bed of an older man. Naomi is able to give this advice because she trusts the character of Boaz not to use or abuse Ruth. And she trusts the purity of Ruth in all of this as well. It's huge. Ruth trusts, and she goes. Okay, so trust. Next one. Starts with a T. Ruth tiptoes. I think she tiptoes. I can't find it in the scripture. But Ruth is tiptoeing into the field, and she's seeing Boaz work and all the other people work, and it's almost like, and there's something just built into us. I still like playing things like capture the flag. That, that there is a tiptoe element of surprise here as Ruth is playing all of this out. And then she, verse four, she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. All right, so sometimes uh, I take naps on the couch, like on accident. <laughs> I'm watching TV, and then my eyes close, and I fall asleep. And there were times when my kids were often smaller where... They would get pretty close to my face when I'm sleeping. And then you get this awareness of like someone is close to my face and you open your eyes and you open your eyes and all of a sudden, boom, there's a kid. And it startles you, right? Because it's not something that you're expecting. And Boaz is startled and then all of a sudden it goes, behold, a woman. And Boaz says, who are you? Now, hold on. If you paid attention to Ruth chapter two, Boaz and Ruth know each other. They've been flirting in in Ruth chapter two. So why does Boaz ask Ruth, who are you? Because our identity, if it's wrapped up in the wrong kind of things, will mess everything up for the rest of your life. What could Ruth have said? Ruth could have described herself as Ruth the Moabite, the lowest of low servants. She actually described herself that way in chapter two. It would not have been wrong. She is a Moabitess, and she wasn't even ranked as one of Boaz's servants, but that's actually not what Ruth says here. Ruth says, I am Ruth, your servant. Another thing where the Hebrew language helps us, Hebrew has lots of words for servant. This word for servant, I am Ruth, your handmaiden, available for marriage to you. Big difference. Lowest of low servants to I'm available for your hand in marriage, your servant for you to possibly propose to. And then Ruth actually doesn't wait for Boaz to propose. Ruth proposes. And Naomi did not give Ruth this instruction. 
So all that that I said about we need to be coachable and we need to sit under the word of God, okay, there is also this Ruth saying, I think I know what is going to accomplish my rest in my home. So now I'm going to ask you, Boaz, to, uh, where is it here? Spread your wings or your garment over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Ruth is saying here, I want to marry you. And if you say yes to this marriage proposal, you'll put your robe over me as a sign that yes, I want to marry you. But the garment and the wings are the same. And you remember in Ruth 2.12, and that's probably worth going there, Boaz says to Ruth this, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz says that to Ruth. And Boaz has sought refuge under the wings of God. But now Ruth is saying, you know what? I believe that God's provision for me and part of what it means for me to seek refuge under the wings of God is for you, Boaz, to be some of that wings and some of that security and some of that rest and some of that home. Once again, Boaz is being invited in to this story to play a part. And she says, I am Ruth, the one that's available for you. And she more or less says, Ruth, sorry, Boaz, save me. Rescue me. Last time I checked, without God, you and I are without a home and without rest. And we may look at ourselves and say, we're not worthy. But God has made us and invited us in and invited us to say, God, you spread your garment over me. I need your security and your rest. And how does Boaz respond? In verse 10, and he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. We'll stop there for a second. First of all, Boaz praises Ruth says, bless you. Um, Same conversation about a mean God that I had earlier was also this idea of of kind of this thought process that men are way up here and women are way down here, that this person had kind of been taught. And Ephesians 5 is very clear in telling us that uh, husbands, well, we'll start with wives, Wives, submit, therefore, to your husbands, okay? Husbands like that one. Why? Because then a husband can say, woman, do what I tell you. If you've ever tried that, I'm available for marriage counseling. (laughs) Because that is what you will need if you try that with your wife. It will not work because it's not God's plan. Because the very next verse says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church and be willing to lay your life down for her. The Boaz here is saying, you know what I'm gonna do? Yes, I am going to protect you. I am going to spread my wings and my garment over you and I'm going to love you and I'm going to say, bless you. And everyone knows, Ruth, You are a worthy woman. Look at Ruth 2, 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, 
whose name was Boaz. Here's what you have happening here. You have a worthy man and a worthy woman coming together to make a God-centered, God-exalting marriage because they are sacrificially showing love and kindness to one another. You know what's interesting, and you know how the enemy drives a wedge between you and I and our marriages? The enemy will do something like this. The enemy will go, well, you know, I mean, if your spouse treated you better, then you could treat them better. Ruth is not holding out and showing kindness to Boaz, and Boaz is not holding out and showing kindness to Ruth that they are mutually showing kindness and deep, deep love for one another. I was talking to a brother before church, and we talked about this amazing picture of Boaz and Ruth in the Bible, and and we have kids, and our kids aren't married yet. And I, I just said, I think I need to be praying for my daughter that she find a worthy Boaz, and for my son that he find a worthy Ruth that we have all these criteria and all these expectations of like what we're looking for in a, in a marriage partner. And that's, this is crucial of gripped by the deep, deep love of Jesus. And I probably, you know, on this Mother's Day, what, what would every mom want more than anything else? That they would know the deep love of God and the deep love of that happening. Some of you are like, well, I'm already uh, in a relationship. I already am married, and I'm not sure my spouse is worthy Boaz or worthy Ruth. Okay, fair enough. Because guess what? You married a sinner. And guess what? You're a sinner too. (laughs) So perhaps instead of going, well, my spouse is not really a worthy Ruth, that you would flip the mirror on yourself and say, God, how might you be calling me to be a worthy Boaz? God, how do I find my refuge and strength under your wings, not contingent on how my spouse may or may not treat me, but what my call is to do everything you tell me to do? Boaz praises Ruth. Boaz says, okay, you could look at this Ruth and go, well, I'm worthy and you're like not. But I'm going to tell you right now and here, Ruth, you are worthy too. And it's not me up here and you down here. It is us as equals entering into this relationship. Next, Boaz protects, sorry, Boaz promises to Ruth. And it says, I will do for you all that you ask and tells Ruth, you don't have to fear. I will do for you all that you ask. But there's a caveat here because there's someone else in line to possibly be a redeemer before Boaz. And we need to read on in order to get that, and then we'll go back. So verse um, 12, and now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. What Boaz is having to do here is he has an opportunity to buy Naomi's field and also assume responsibility for Naomi and Ruth. But there was an order and there's a line and Boaz says, I'm not number one, I'm number two. And number one needs to have an opportunity to decide if he wants the field and if he wants you. And we don't get this in this culture today. And I think it's important to say Ruth and Boaz deeply love each other. And you know what I I, I think even when I met my wife, if I would have found out that there was someone in line before me to marry my wife, I think, and I don't really step on people, okay, but I would have stepped on such a person. I would have said, "Uh uh-uh, no, I want her. I don't care what protocol is in this situation. I want to marry her. And maybe we can just go off to Vegas. No, I don't like that city, but lots of people go to Vegas to get married, right? That that we just go and do it. But Boaz says, you know what? At the end of everything, there is a sovereign plan of God. And I will submit myself to his sovereign plan. 
and his sovereign order. So Boaz praises Ruth. Boaz promises Ruth. But Boaz is radically patient. And Boaz realizes that he does not have complete and total control of the situation. Guess what, guys? As much as you and I want to plan, you and I do not have total and complete control of any situation. And it is important just to acknowledge that. God, you have control. I can do what I can do, but ultimately at the end of it all, you decide. And that we would be patient and wait and submit to that. But what does Boaz say at the end? I will redeem you as surely as the Lord lives if this person is not willing to. And then in verse 14, so she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another, one could recognize another. And he said, let it be known that the woman came, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? This translation is, who are you, my daughter? Remember how Boaz asked Ruth, who are you? Now Naomi is asking, who are you? And the main thing is, are you Boaz's fiance? Or are you Ruth the Moabite? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how this matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Ruth goes back, and she goes back with food. She goes back not empty-handed. Naomi said, I'm empty-handed, and Boaz says, I want to prove to you that you're not empty-handed. Guys, when we walk with the Lord, there will be seasons of difficulty and pain and agony, but as you continue to walk with the Lord, the Lord will fill your cup. The Lord will help you. You will not be fully empty-handed. And then look at the trust that Naomi has in Boaz. The man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. What a great application for you and I today. Today is the only day that we can count on. The only time that you and I can count on is this right now present moment. And Naomi says, the Redeemer, your Redeemer, Ruth will not rest until it's taken care of. She has a Redeemer with a lowercase r. We have a Redeemer with a capital R. And our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will not rest until we're all the way home. That's why Hebrews 7.25 says, he lives to intercede for us, and that's how he's able to save us completely. You have a Redeemer in heaven that works for you. And really, ultimately, the question for me this week is, how coachable am I? How much do I really genuinely trust the Redeemer that works for me to bring me all the way home? Do I push back in certain things? Do I think that I can actually get uh, popularity and pleasure and prestige apart from doing what God says is best? Or do I know I need him? And he knows best. Because you know how I talked about exegeting culture. There is a culture of the kingdom. And you know who the one who understands the culture of the kingdom? It's, it's the one who is bringing the kingdom of God down from heaven to earth. And he understands this culture. And the culture of the kingdom doesn't always make sense with my kingdom. But the culture of his kingdom is what lasts forever and ever. So Ruth and Naomi and Boaz are trusting the Redeemer, 
will not rest until it's done. But you know what they're doing at the end of the chapter? They're waiting. They're waiting for God to work. And sometimes we work and sometimes we wait. So we end this sermon with a position of waiting. If you believe in spoiler alerts, then read on to chapter four and you get to the end before next week. But what is it that God's calling you to wait on? It could be a repaired relationship. It could be restored health. It could be a fresh word from him. Know this, he is worth waiting for. And when you don't feel like he's working, he is working for your good and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, help us during these moments to wait on you, the one who promises to work for us. And help us, God, to be activated into your great plan of redemption, invited in. God, may it change us from the inside out. We come to you empty, trusting that you will fill us. We come to you as far from you, knowing, God, that you are the one who can bring us back. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final song today is called No Longer Slaves. And it talks about identity and um, what you and I see in the mirror and what you and I see in God matters of immense importance as to who we are. And uh, I was surfing Facebook earlier this week and another friend of mine that pastors a church in Arkansas said, uh, moms, I need your help. I need you to share with me what are some of the most challenging things about being a mom. And there were like 87 comments And I didn't read them all. I read about the first 15, and I found a common theme. And the common theme was, I'm not good enough. I failed. I believe that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And I believe that our advocate before the Father is Jesus. And he says, I have redeemed you. I have spread my garment over you. I have given you a robe of righteousness. Who is there to condemn you? I throw your sins into a sea of forgetfulness and remember them no more. I have removed them as far as the east is from the west. And I have told you, you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are my child. Find refuge under my wings. And you don't have to be a mom to feel like I failed. What if all of us today say, Lord Jesus, spread your garment over me. Protect me under the shadow of your wings, for I am available to you to be used for your purposes. We are no longer slaves. We are children of God. I invite you to stand and sing.
one of the most amazing things about Boaz is that Boaz wasn't obligated to Ruth. Boaz didn't have to, you know, redeem Ruth by the field. Boaz was moved. Boaz was in love, but not the kind of in love that our culture says, as as long as I'm getting everything I want, then I'm in love with you. Boaz was loving Ruth to the degree of sacrifice where it cost him something. Jesus was not obligated to save you. He wanted to. That he wanted to glorify his father and redeem the people of God. And I want to invite you as you're thinking about, okay, I've been adopted as a son or daughter of God and I'm no longer a slave to fear. Who do you see in your life still a slave to fear? And how do you treat those in your life that are still slaves to fear? I discovered the other day uh, that my son asked for help for something at an inconvenient time. Kids tend to do that sometimes. And I went, oh, okay. And he immediately went, never mind, Dad. Never mind. I wish I could have that moment back. Because you know what? Every single time that I approach God, and go, God, I need help. I know you're probably trying to solve world hunger and world peace, but I need help with this little bitty thing. He doesn't go, oh, Stephen. Okay. He runs to me. That he is a helper and an ever-present help in times of trouble. And that you and I have access to him and that we would be those of a posture that says my God never sees me as a burden or an inconvenience he sees me as a delight and an adopted son or daughter of the king help me love the people in my life like my heavenly father loves me And that God would do a work in us to make us worthy by his righteousness. And that his kindness would flow out of us. Here's the greatest news. And this is our benediction. It's from Ezekiel 36. This is what God says. Outstretched hands just to receive this. God says, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. God, may you do this in us and may we brag and boast about the great redeemer we have and your son, our savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Mother's Day. God bless you all.